Journeying on this dirt path called life can leave you beaten, bruised, and defeated. Our hearts crave a reason to keep going, and our minds seek something to make sense of it all. This is why I explore the depths of the Bible with real Jesus as that hope and the one who holds our answers. This is a sermon podcast of my weekly sermon at the Ravenna Church in Nazarene, located in Ravenna, Kentucky. That is a deep question. Seems like some, so why why that way, Lord? What? Uh, whenever you watch the superhero movies, there's always a lot of violence, and bombs, and all kinds of action. But when God actually came to save the world, it wasn't that way, was it? Hmm. Maybe maybe superheroes aren't what we thought they were. Hmm. There's a sermon in that somewhere. I'm not going to preach that one today, but. Uh, turn with me to the book of James, James chapter 5. Uh, one of the things about Advent that you know, we, we celebrate the first coming of Jesus, and you know, He's born in the manger, He lived and died on the cross for us, rose again. But when He left that first time, that was, that was the first time, you know, He came the first time, that was the first Advent. But whenever we're celebrating the first Advent, we can't help but think about that there's going to be a second one. When Jesus comes back again. And that's when He's going to come back and He's going to make all things right. He's going to make all things new. And He's going to reign forevermore. And that's, that's the joy of Christianity. That is the hope that we have. It's not a wish. It's, it's not a maybe. No, this is going to happen. In the early church, they believed that Jesus was probably going to be back tomorrow. That's the way they lived their lives. That's the way they went about ministering. They believed Jesus would, was going to come back sometime during their lifetime, and they were, going to, they were going to see it. So they lived their life with that expectation. James, this, the Apostle James that writes this letter, this is James, the brother of Jesus. Right? You know, there's two James that are disciples of Jesus. There's James, the son of Zebedee, who is one of the sons of thunder. And then there's James, the brother of Jesus. And uh, church tradition has some interesting story, uh, an interesting story about uh, James, the brother of Jesus, the writer of this, this text today. Um, he was the first, considered the first bishop over Jer- the church in Jerusalem. That, that's where he resided. That's what he oversaw. And every day he would go into the temple... And he would pray for the lost. Uh, church, church tradition holds that he, he would go in the temple so often and just fall on his hands and knees before God and he would cry out the names of the lost people that were in, that he knew or that the church was ministering to. And he did it so much that he wore his knees out. Like he had big old calluses on his knees from all the time he spent on, before God praying to God. And I'm dropping my microphone. Well, not only did he do that, he would go into the temple and he would preach Jesus too, right? And people would get saved there. And the one thing we know about the Jews is whenever they, they, they didn't like Jesus very much. And the other thing they didn't like was people preaching about Jesus and people getting saved. But that's what was happening through James' preaching in the temple. So finally the Pharisees have enough of James and they have him arrested. And they're questioning him. And they, the big question they're asking him is, what, what does this mean that Jesus is the door? The door, what is that? And he would tell them, he's the only way that you can be saved. you got to believe in Jesus. That is your hope. That's the only way out of this. Of course, the Pharisees didn't like that answer, so they decided, you know what, we're going to kill him. And so they take him outside to the top of the temple. And they, they present the question to the crowd, and, and James gives that answer. But as he gives that answer, he starts preaching and people get saved. Hundreds, thousands are getting saved at the temple that day through James's preaching. And the Pharisees, they get so fed up with it that they, they run and they just throw him off the top of the temple. And he falls. We're not talking like this is a short little fall. This is a big drop. But think about it. Think, remember, remember what the, Satan did to Jesus when he tempted Jesus? He took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, jump down. And then the angels will catch you. That's how high this is. And they throw James off, but he survives. He doesn't die through from this fall. What, what, kills, what finally happens, because he gets up and he's still alive, they end up stoning him to death. 
And, and that, you know, that's just one story of thousands of the early church. They accepted Jesus, they accepted the, 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 you know, the, the hope of salvation in Him, but that's what they had to endure in the beginning. And they endured that believing all the while that Jesus would be back tomorrow. And if I could just hang on for a little bit longer, Jesus will be here. And it's with that kind of mindset that James is writing this text today. This, this, this expectation that Jesus will be back. To, if I can just hold on a little bit longer, if you can just hang on, Jesus will be here. So James chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. And it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the, the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains? You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So if you kind of read the verses right before this, James is kind of imploring these Christians, hey, I know you're being oppressed. I know the rich people that are in the church and, and the rich people in the area, they're using their money against you to suppress you. But hold on. Don't give up hope. Don't turn your back on Jesus. Hold on to the faith. And he uses that, that swear word in the English language. Right? We, we see it at least four times here. That word, patience. Be patient. We were talking about this in Sunday school class. Have you noticed that when you go to a fast food restaurant now, it's not fast food? If I wanted to wait 30 minutes in line for food that was not that great, I would, you know, if, I, if I wanted to wait 30 minutes for food that wasn't that great, I would just stay home and cook myself. Right? But when I want a cheeseburger from McDonald's, I want to get there, I want to get the, through the drive through and get on with my day, because I'm in a hurry. I don't have time to be sitting there waiting. And what happens when, when we get there and we have to sit there and wait for our cheeseburger? We start griping about it, don't we? It's like, I got places to go. I, I'm, I'm going to be late to this event. And then the make matters worse, you get all the way through the drive through line, you get your food, you get home, you ordered it with no pickles, and then you realize they've got pickles on it. <sighs> Why me, Lord? Why me? That's how we. That's the society we live in, though, right? We want. We want what we want when we want it, right then. We don't want to wait for anything. And we kind of sometimes we take that into our spiritual life, right? We we. You know, I'm dealing with this problem, Lord. I'm dealing with this. This, this problem in my life, I'm dealing with this person over here, and I want, what I want you to do, God, I want you to step in right now and fix it in this moment so I don't have to deal with it. But God doesn't always work according to our timetable, does He? We have to wait. And that's what James is talking about here. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. He's saying, I know you're dealing with some problems right now. I know it's not pleasant. It's not good. He's not making light of the situation. He's not making, you know, he's not, he's not trying to minimize the impact of what's happening on the church in that moment. He's just saying, Be patient because Jesus is coming. You don't know, we don't know this, but, but you know, Jesus says he's coming back in. And if you can just hold on for another 24 hours, Jesus will be back tomorrow. And, and if you can hold on till then, I promise you, it will be worth it all. But if you can just hold on until then. 
Then he talks about, James and, and continues in verse 7, he starts talking about, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until he receives the early and the late rains. Those rains were important. There was one that was in, happened in November. There was one that happened in the, in the springtime, I think around April. And, and in that climate, those rains were very important for the growth of the crops. But as a farmer, you have no control over the rain, do you? You don't decide when it rains. But what also is implying in this, like, so, so the farmer has to wait and trust that the one who's in charge of the rain will send the rains to water the crops. But that farmer had work to do, didn't he? If he wanted that rain to come and water his crops, what did he first have to do? He had first had to, he had, he had to plant the seeds. And even before he planted the seeds, he had to go out and make sure the soil was ready. This is why I'm not a gardener. And even when I do try and garden, I can't tell the difference between the weeds or the, or the flower. And so I just pull it all, and then I have nothing. But see, the farmer has to know that, right? The farmer has to study that. He has to, he has to recognize the weeds, pull those out, and has to see how they're different from the regular flower or whatever he's growing. So the farmer, while he is waiting for the rains to come, the farmer has to go about doing the work of farming. What James is getting after this is this, and then he, this is what he's saying in verse 8. He says, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. He's saying, hey, I know this is terrible right now, but you are called to follow Jesus. You are called to tell the story of Jesus. You're called to spread the message to make sure the world knows that Jesus died for them and that there is salvation in his name. I know what you're going through isn't pleasant. I know you want it to be over. But if you can hang on a little bit longer, Jesus is coming. And while you're waiting to come, you still have work to do. Essentially, he's telling them, don't let what you're dealing with, don't let, your, don't let the problems, don't let the circumstances can stop you from doing what Jesus called you to do. Now, this word patience here in the original language, it actually has kind of to do with a, a judge who is very long-suffering. Think of a judge that's been working with somebody that's troubled. And they've, you know, they've seen this person time and time again for the same old infractions. The judge could throw the book at him. That might help him. Or he or she might do it in steps or phases, right? They're, they're, they're not wanting to throw this person in jail. They're not wanting this person to be locked away for the rest of their lives. What they're really wanting is for this person to see the error of their ways, change it, and grow and be different. So they patiently keep working with them. Keep giving them chances. Keep giving, that, and that's the idea behind patience here. Is this idea of long-suffering. To standing firm. Strengthen your hearts. Because oftentimes that strength of your heart, and my heart, that's what gets us through those tough moments. That's what keeps us going. Our faith in Jesus and, and our ability to, to, to not let the circumstances stop us. But man, sometimes it's so hard. It's so difficult because what we're up against, what we're dealing with, seems impossible. Couple, I think it was last Sunday night, my, my Colts played on Sunday night football. And why they keep putting them in primetime television, I'll never know. Because they're not very good this year. And if you watched Sunday night football last week, like I did and sat through the whole thing, I can't believe it. Nicole wouldn't, didn't make me turn the TV off, and I was hoping she would. It was 21 19 at the end of the third quarter. About five minutes later, it was 54 19. But as, you're, as I was watching the game, I noticed an interesting thing. 
because when it was, the score was, they were only trailing by two points. You could see the hope in the players. You could see that they were still fighting for something. And then the quarterback threw an interception. Then they got the ball back and they fumbled it back to the other team again. And you watched the, the energy level just be sucked out of that team. They lost their heart. They lost their will to keep going. And then they just, they just stayed in the game because they had to finish. But they didn't, the heart and the energy wasn't in it. That's how some of us are living our lives, right? That's what we're experiencing. We, we're, we've been pressing forward so hard. We've been trying for so long, but we're just so tired of it. And James is writing to Christians in that situation saying, you know what? Strengthen your heart. Keep holding on. Keep going because, because Jesus could be back tomorrow. If you can just hold on a little bit longer, Jesus will be there. And all this will go away. But until then, you have work to do. Now in verse 9, James continues. He says, Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Don't complain about one another. See, so often when things start going wrong, we start looking around and pointing fingers at the person next to us. They're going through the same misery we are, but we're so we can we're experiencing so much emotion, so much anger, so much sadness that that we can't contain it in. But rather than process it in a healthy way, we lash out at the person next to us. We're trying to find somebody to blame. We're trying to to take our anger and send it in another direction. And oftentimes we take it on the people that care about us most or the people that are trying to fight through it with us. Don't complain. Now, this, this, this is going to step on little toes, okay? But in the church world right now, there's a lot of this. I'm not complaining. I'm pointing it out to you and to me. There's a lot of this going on right now, right? A lot of complaining. We're looking at the state of our nation. We're looking at the state of, of, the, of the church right now, and we're saying, well, you know, things just aren't what they used to be. Well, if we could just go back to where it was before. Well, these darn kids and their rock and roll music. I have a friend that we re- sometimes we refer to some of the Christian bands, uh, song, some of the modern Christian songs as Jesus is my boyfriend song. But we complain. There's a lot of in the church right now because the church, we're, not, we're experiencing some tough times and we're looking around, we're like, what's the problem? But instead of trying to, to focus on Jesus, our hope, we're looking at all the things and we're finding reasons to complain and why the church is broken. And we're ignoring the biggest reason of us because we've taken our eyes off Jesus and we're looking at all these other things trying to find the solution there. The solution or not is not in these little things, it's in Jesus. So we can sit and complain all we want. For one, one time doesn't go backward. Time goes forward. So the, and Jesus is coming in the future. So stop looking backwards. Start looking to Jesus who is coming. That's another reason why James tells him, James tells him, hey, be busy. Jesus might be back tomorrow. You might just have to suffer a little bit longer. Hang on. Be busy. Because this thing, if you're truly focused on Jesus and you're working on building his kingdom, you don't have time to stop and complain. You don't have time to whine about things. And perhaps that's one of our problems right now as a church. Not this church, but church in large, okay? You all are working hard. And uh, I can, the blessing box, you know, we put that up. And it, man, it's been blessing people. We've been, had it two weeks, and we've had to refill it, what, four or five times already? Uh, your tithes and offerings are coming in here. They're not just coming in and sitting, sitting in the church bank account. Vicky, Vicky and I and, and the board, we're not planning a trip to the Bahamas. 
We're taking that money and we're turning it around and using it for the kingdom. We're helping the pregnancy center. We're helping people that are asking us for help. Why? To show people Jesus. We're going about doing the work. The thing is that when we stop doing the work, when we stop doing the things for the kingdom, and we start complaining, it's actually a sign that we're not doing anything. Think about it. Usually the person that's complaining the loudest is the person that's just sitting there. Right? I worked for some managers that were that way. All they did was whine and complain. But they wouldn't get up and do a thing themselves. Or sometimes we complain because we, 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 we've allowed pride to creep into our hearts and we become so prideful about what we're doing that we, we stop caring about why we're doing the work. We're just, we just want the recognition and the power and, the, and the, the prestige that comes from what we're doing. And that's not good either. But again, those are things that happen to the church when we take our focus off of Jesus and Him being our hope, Him being our joy, And we begin to focus on other things. And when our heart's not in the right spot, when we're up against those hard times where we're supposed to strengthen our hearts and hang on, we can't do it because why our heart is focused on after the wrong things. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord is coming. If you can just hang on a little bit longer, if you can just keep working a little bit more and press forward, oh man, Jesus is coming. He kind of adds this phrase in here. Look, the judge stands at the door. See, so often in the church we spend time complaining and whining about the situations that and then oftentimes we'll judge one another. Well, you know, I'm, I'm more holy than they are because I sat on, the, on the, this side of the sanctuary instead of this side. I don't know why that is. This is a question that ponders me. You know, this is off topic, but as your pastor, is there something wrong with this side of the sanctuary? <laughs> I've noticed that you all tend to grab it. This side's a little fuller today, so thank you all for coming and filling this side. But it, many times I feel like we're, the ship is going to tip over because everybody's over here. But we try to be the judge, right? We try to judge one another. We try and to judge people in the world even. Again, that's a sign that we're not focused on the right things and we're not focused on Jesus because when you really study Scripture, what it really boils down to, you and I are, are not the judge of everything. There's only one Lord of all, and that's Jesus. And when He comes back in, He's going to judge everybody. And so when, when James is saying the judge is at the door, think of the verse in, in the Revelation where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The judge is about to knock on the door. He's going to be the one that opens it. He's going to come in and He's going to decide where everybody stands. So stop, don't complain about one another. Keep pressing on strength in your heart. Hold on just a little bit longer because Jesus is going to be here. And then lastly, in verse 10, James points, tells us to look back at the prophets in the Old Testament. Remember, James' letter wasn't Scripture when he wrote it. He was writing it to the Christians in Jerusalem during this time period where intense persecution was happening. And so when he's telling them, hey, go back to the prophets, he's telling them, go, go read about Job. Job, he had a rough time, didn't he? Woke up one day, he lost his, lost his family, lost his house, lost all of his income. Not one time did he curse God. He, he asked God some tough questions. Don't you read the book of Job? He's going to ask God some tough questions, and he's not necessarily, you know, oh, dear Lord. Why is this happening? It's, God, what's going on? If I've done something wrong, show me. Because I don't get this. He had some intense conversation with God. But he didn't sin. Let Job be an example. Think about Moses, right? God called him at that burning bush and sent him to, to deal with the people. 
And they grumbled and complained all through the wilderness. He had to deal with Pharaoh who didn't believe God. He had to deal with his own people who didn't believe God. He had to deal with his brother and sister, you know, getting in his way every once in a while. But man was, man was Moses a man after God. Man, did he cling to his faith. How about the prophet Jeremiah? When God calls Jeremiah to go and tell the people that bad things are going to happen, God adds another phrase in there. He says, I want you to go do this, but I want you to know up front they're not going to listen to you. Why are you sending me, God? What's the point of me going and talking if nobody's going to listen? That's not the point. <laughs> and Jeremiah, I mean, there's, he's called the weeping prophet. Why? Because he cries all the time. Because he's dealing with the people that won't listen, that are mistreating him. They throw him in a pit, leave him for dead. But man, he was a man of faith. These are the examples that God has given us. They were in these impossible situations, these impossible circumstances. That they, they found heart, and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? God's presence was with them and encouraged them and strengthened them. They clung to that, and they had hope. And they, didn't, they were waiting for Jesus to come the first time. To you and I. If we want to have joy in our lives, when I talk about joy, I'm not talking about a happy feeling, right? Feelings come and go. Joy isn't a feeling. Joy is not an emotion. Joy is a state of being. It's a, con it's a deep, rested contentment. It's a confidence. And we, we have that confidence. We have that shirt. We can have that contentment. Why? Because we know that no matter how bad it gets here, if we can just hold on for a little while longer, Jesus is coming. And if I don't make it to that point, then guess what? I get to go be with him for when that moment comes. That is our hope. And that gives us joy in, every, in all circumstances. Does that mean when my tire goes flat that it's not going to be irritating? No. But it means this is not the worst thing that can happen to me. And what's going to happen to me in my future is way better than this moment. So I can keep going with joy of knowing that Jesus is with me and I'm going to be with him for all time. It's so easy to lose sight of Jesus when things get foggy. When the battle get, gets heavy, you don't always remember things the way you should. But that's why we, when we come and gather together, we open up this book together. We pray. We lift up praises to God for what He's doing. Because those are the stories. Those are the words that the Holy Spirit's going to etch on our hearts and minds for when those times come. And we need to find that something to keep us going. Something to, to keep pulling us onward. I, I know, I, I'm sure I shared this story with you all before. When I was going through my divorce and, and trying to figure out what was going to happen next, I couldn't feel God's presence in my life. I kept going to church anyway, though. And the pastor asked me if I would work with the teenagers. And I said, sure, because I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and worked with those teenagers, though. And I, could, I, I, mean, I was teaching them every Wednesday night. And I was spending all this time investing in them and telling them about Jesus and pointing them to Jesus. But I couldn't feel Jesus in my own life. But something interesting started to happen. As I kept showing up where I was supposed to be, doing the things that God called me to do, I began to see Jesus move in their lives. I began to see them grow through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I knew if Jesus was working in their life and empowering them, that He was very close to me. And if I could just hang on a little bit longer, Jesus was coming. So again, I don't know what it is you're dealing with today. I don't know what's going on. But my, my message to you, my, my word to you today is keep praising the name of Jesus. Keep pressing onward. Because if you can just hold on a little bit longer, Jesus is coming. And he's either coming back again once and for all to make all things right for all time's sake. Or he's going to show up in a mighty way in your life that you could have never dreamed or imagined. 
I keep telling this to Nicole all of, uh, repeatedly. We are either on the verge of the great awakening or another great awakening. Because we're at a point in time in history when the world needs to hear the message of Jesus afresh and anew. And we have the opportunity to do that. Oh, but we have to focus our eyes on Jesus. We have to keep pressing onward if we want to see, if we want to experience Jesus in that, that real mighty way. We got to see, blessed be the name of the Lord. And keep going about, and then we'll see him again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dirt Pastorman Podcast. It is recorded live at the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene, located at 530 Main Street in Ravenna, Kentucky. Our theme song is The Dirt Path by Jeremy Edwards. Be sure to visit the thedirtpastsimonpodcast.com where you can leave me a message, subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and find daily devotional videos. <laughs>